So thank you very much for allowing me the privilege of being your bishop lecturer this year, which of course came about um, somewhat unexpectedly due to uh, coronavirus, but um, it is really a treat and an honor to be able to um, take this role. In my role as uh, director of the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine, I've had the privilege of meeting the bishop family uh, year after year um, for the past few years um, for this event, and it is uh, such an honor and privilege to be uh, speaking in this particular role. Um, I want to take a moment right now before I forget to acknowledge um, the tremendous work that goes into preparing this symposium, and in particular the work of um, Valerie Kahn, our center manager, um, whom you've heard from briefly um, earlier today, um, and all of the staff who um, are here um, and working very hard uh, to make this uh, such a seamless and wonderful event for everyone. Um, thank you all for your participation in the center. Um, it is truly the best part of my job. Um, this was not a job that I actually thought that I would ever have or that I aspired to, but it was a it was a true gift. Um, it is something that um, brings me such energy, and I think just the discussions we've had so far this morning, the richness of the discourse that we have in this center is um, is just really invigorating. So what we're going to do for the next hour is talk a little bit about a subject that is growing, uh, that is gathering. Um, growing attention, which is promoting gender equity in medicine. And I'd like to take a bit of an evidence-based approach as a bioethicist and social scientist. And so what we'll do is we'll talk a bit about some of the evidence that our group here and others have collected about the nature and causes of gender inequity in academic medicine. And those data establish pretty clearly that the challenge here is not simply a slow and intact pipeline, but in fact, dysfunction in the pipeline itself and reflects the differential impact of a number of challenges, including unconscious biases, gendered expectations of society, and overt discrimination and harassment. And then what we'll do, like good scholars in medicine, is we'll take that information about etiology and we will actually use it to inform intervention. So I believe most of you are aware that women are now actually more than 50% of the medical student body. That's actually new. That's this year. It's been a statistic that I've heard ever since I was back in medical school that women were um, more than half of the medical student body. That was true at individual isolated medical schools before. Um, it was not. And then a couple of years ago, women became the majority of medical school matriculants. But it wasn't until this year that women actually now constitute a majority of US medical students. But you can see there that the pace of progress really accelerated after 1972 with the passage of Title IX. So even though the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1965 applied to sex as well as to race, it exempted institutions of higher education. And so medical schools were allowed until Title IX in 1972 to discriminate against women uh, in terms of hiring, promotions, and admissions. Indeed, the ex explanation for why there were only four slots at the University of Michigan Medical School when the bishops attended, right? And so after 1972, there was a relatively rapid increase in women's participation. And as you can see there, it's been over a quarter of a century that women have constituted more than 40% of all medical students. And in fact, when I was a medical student, my own medical school class was over 50% female. And most people of my generation, I'm a generation Xer, although my daughter informs me that we're all one generation now, OK, boomers? We're <laughs> <laughs> but my generation really did believe that some of the inequity that we were seeing, or not inequity, some of the inequality we were say, seeing in terms of women's participation in leadership positions when we were students was an artifact of a long and slow but intact pipeline. And that in 1995, when I actually entered medical school, um, this was a time when the executive leadership and academic medicine program began. This was um, a program that is run out of Drexel University, the, the home of the uh, former women's college, medical college of Pennsylvania, the first medical school for uh, women in the United States, a very historic place for a program that promotes executive leadership skills amongst um, women in medicine. And when that program was founded in 1995, the very year that I entered medical school, it was believed by its founders to be a temporary program something that would address a need for that 
first cohort of leaders who went to medical school in the 70s, who were reaching that age to become leaders in the, in the late 90s. And it would equip them with the um, skills and uh, information that they needed. And then it wouldn't be needed any longer. Well, ELAM is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. I'm in its 25th anniversary class. Um, and it is oversubscribed and still needed. So we need to understand what's going on here. Turns out that women are not very well represented in leadership positions in academic medicine even today, even though it's been a quarter of a century that women were more than 40% of the medical student body. Um, I've told you, um, and, I, and I see someone squinting from the Bishop family, which is great, because if you look at the year there, what date am I presenting to you? 2013-14. Am I trying to pull a fast one here? Am I giving you five-year-old data? Am I too lazy to update my slides? No. Actually, the reason that this is 2013-14 data is it's a beautiful picture of a pipeline. And the AAMC is updating their report this year. I'm hoping there'll be another pipeline that I can put up soon. But this is the only picture of a pipeline there is. And it actually kind of serves to illustrate a point. Um, these data are not really all that different. Now, I just told you the front of the pipeline is more female than it was in 2013-14. You know how the back end looks? 18% of deans, 22% of full professors. Almost no change in five years. And so that is quite a concern. And of course, we've also seen um, in one of the first studies that I ever did in this area that women are not well represented in the major way that we communicate in academic medicine, in publications. So women constituted at that time and in studies that have been done since a very small share of authors of medical literature, invited editorial writers, and editorial board members. And why does this matter? Well, you know, this is not only the way that we communicate with one another, this is the way that we set the agenda for research in the field, right? So editorial board members actually can influence the direction of research, right? So I was an editor at the International Journal for Radiation Oncology, Biology, Physics. That is a mouthful even for someone who talks as fast as I do. And so we call it the Red Journal in Radiation Oncology. Um, in the Red Journal, we decided to have a silver edition to focus on the experiences and outcomes of older adults receiving cancer treatment with radiation therapy. And when the Red Journal editors decided to have a silver edition, not only did it prompt investigators to do subset analyses by age of existing data sets, it also prompted investigators to begin careers studying this and to pursue prospective research and investigation looking at differences in experiences and outcomes of older adults versus others receiving radiation treatment, right? So it, it channeled the direction of research in a field. And in fact, the, one of the greatest examples of this is the, the Lancet actually last year decided to have a theme issue on women in medicine and science and global health. And I was fortunate enough to be part of the advisory committee for that theme issue. And I remember thinking, we'll get you know, a couple dozen good submissions. You know, It's the Lancet. They only publish a couple of original research things. And then we'll have some letters. And we'll invite some editorials. And it'll be a nice theme issue. Um, we didn't get a couple dozen submissions. We got 300 submissions. They gave people four months to develop papers. And they got 300 submissions. So no, they didn't all get published in the theme issue of the Lancet. But much of the research that you're seeing come out in many, many, many other journals on this subject was prompted by the decision of the editorial board and editors at The Lancet to create that theme issue. So these are incredibly important positions. When we published this study, um, a very wise reporter decided not just to interview me as the author of the study, but to interview the editor at the New England Journal who decided to publish this and said, doesn't this kind of make you look bad? You know, what do you think? And the response was, well, we think this is important because we actually believe in the integrity of our process. We don't think that it's biased in our process. What we're seeing is that women are not reaching the point of getting to lead research that is worthy of publication in journals like the New England Journal of Medicine. And so we think this is a, this is a problem. It's a serious problem. But it's, it's really not our fault. Now, actually, we could do better with invited editorialists. She actually said that in a quote um, uh, to that reporter. And over time, they have indeed done better with invited editorialists. It's not parity, but it is certainly improved. 
whether that is due to active um, intentional change or the pipeline, it's hard to it's hard to shake out. But I want to go back to that point of has nothing to do with our processes, right? So in academic medicine, we tend to engage in a system of single blinded peer review. Not all journals, there's some double open, there's some double blinded, but um, most journals have single blinded peer review. What do I mean by that? I mean that the authors typically do not know the identities of the reviewers, but the reviewers typically do know the identities of the authors. So why does that matter? Well, it's an audience of, of many sophisticated social scientists, right? So we used to think women couldn't play musical instruments as well as men, and we thought it was a physiological difference, right? Women did not have the finger span to master Rachmaninoff. Women did not have the vital lung capacity to blow into wind instruments. And so unfortunately, women were just disadvantaged in making music. And then they introduced a relatively simple intervention, which was a screen between the auditioner and the evaluator, and actually a, a carpet to mask the sound of the heels of the shoes. And when they did that, it became very clear that women sound like they can play music. They just don't look like they can. <laughs> so if we want to do better, we should give thought to the processes of peer review in addition to trying to understand what is happen happening even earlier in the process. Ultimately, this is a matter of professional ethics. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Michelle Mello at Stanford on a piece that will be out soon, um, specifically calling out the fact that our codes of ethics could and should say more uh, because there are both strong deontological and teleological arguments uh, that can be articulated for the need to promote gender equity, right? So you guys are an audience of, of bioethicists, but what do I mean by this for the person who might be not on live stream but listening to this recording later on? Um, Deontological arguments, as we all know in this room, are arguments that are grounded in uh, the theories of Immanuel Kant and those who argue that human beings uh, have a fundamental dignity that derives from our ability for freely willed action and rational thought, and that dignity merits respect for its own sake, right? We must respect persons qua persons. And so when we act, we must act to respect fundamental human dignity and fair equality of opportunity to achieve positions that are sought after and influential, like senior leadership positions in academic medicine, well, doing that is necessary to demonstrate the appropriate respect for human dignity. So this is not an argument about consequences. This is an argument about something being right for its own sake. And this is the most powerful moral argument one can make here, right? Equity is important because it's fair. It is right. And yet, when we try to negotiate for resources to promote gender equity, um, we can run up against a really interesting challenge. Um, the person with whom we're discussing the need for equity can hear on their end, you're being unfair. You're doing something that's not right. And in my lived experience, actually, there are relatively few people, possibly outside of the White House today, um, who wake up in the morning and think about how they're going to oppress all the people in their employ. <laughs> I actually think that most leaders really do have a fundamental commitment to mission and do try to treat people fairly. And so when we are talking with our leaders in particular about this issue, it's important to emphasize the teleological arguments. What are the consequences that occur if we don't have diversity, equity, and inclusion? So in academic medicine, we have a tripartite mission. We talk about the pedagogical mission, right? Education of the next generation of scholars. So um, I just told you, half the medical school, school, school classes is female. We really need some senior female role models to inspire us, like our, our executive vice dean for academic affairs, who's looking at me and inspiring me right now, Carol Bradford, who will be on the panel in a moment. <laughs> uh, we need diversity for research, right? We're here at the University of Michigan. Most of you have read Scott Page's book, right? There, there is tremendous evidence from social science that suggests that when you bring together people with um, different experiences and backgrounds and you allow them to interact, that you actually end up with more innovative approaches and you end up with better answers, right? There was a science paper on collective intelligence and collective intelligence is improved 
by having people take turns, hearing from everyone around the table, and female leadership, right? Having women represented. I'm not saying that we need all female leaders. I'm just saying let's have more than 18%. And the teleological arguments in medicine also extend to our clinical care mission. And these are fascinating studies, right? So I won't tell you about all of them, but I'll talk about that one up in the top right corner, which is a study of what happens to you if you have a heart attack. So if you're a man and you have a heart attack, you have the same mortality outcomes whether you're seen by a physician who's male or female when you come in with your symptoms of your heart attack. Pretty expected, right? If you're a woman and you come in and you are seen by a female physician, you have mortality outcomes that are similar to the man seen by a woman or by a man. All good. If you're a woman and you are seen by a male physician, you actually have worse mortality outcomes than the other three groups. So let's pause and try to think about that. Um, there's a really interesting additional fact in that study. Those women who were cared for by male physicians who practiced in groups with other female physicians, higher proportions of female phys physicians, were better at taking care of female patients. Their outcomes were better. And what it suggests is that we've had a long time of being taught that the male medical model of disease is the norm and the female is the deviation. When 50% of the population presents with certain symptoms for a myocardial infarction, why exactly is that atypical chest pain? So there are important teleological arguments that can be made here. But maybe we can just wait this out. The older and older I get, the less compelling this seems to me. <laughs> but every time I cut this slide, I get a question at the end that says, but yeah, you know, women haven't really been that large a share of the medical student body, even though I show that women have been more than 40% for 25 years. But you know, just wait, 25 years isn't long enough. We have such a long pipeline in medicine, you need to wait just a little longer. Well, the best way to look at this is actually to do cohort studies. And Lynn Nonemaker actually did one of these, published it in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2000, where she looked at 15 cohorts who graduated medical school from 1979 to 1993. And what she found was that the proportion of women who advanced to the rank of associate professor was significantly lower than expected in all but two of the cohorts that she studied. And even the women who reached the rank of associate professor were significantly less likely than their male counterparts to become full professors. And it wasn't a small difference. The difference between observed and expected was five standard deviations off. Huge. But there are criticisms, one of which could be that that was a whole, uh, that was a, a completely different era. That was a long time ago. I just told you things really changed in the 90s, right? So um, Bapu Jenna's group at Mass General have done a wonderful study using doximity data that sadly updates this and shows that it's still the case even with more recent cohorts of medical school graduates. But a broader criticism of this type of cohort study is that it might confuse apples with oranges that it might actually be comparing women who are more likely, on the average, to perhaps enter academic medicine for feminine reasons, like teaching the next generation, mentorship, and providing high-quality clinical care in a team-based environment. Those kinds of communal behaviors that we inculcate in little girls, women may be more likely to enter academic medicine to do those things and those aspects of our shared mission. And that men who have been schooled in being agentic from a very young age in doing something will be more likely to enter academic medicine because of a desire to pursue scholarly discovery. And so what we might be discovering here is not that we're treating apples and apples differently, but that we just have apples and oranges. Well, if we have apples and oranges and there's a tripartite mission, and we always talk about it as a three-legged stool, how can you have a three-legged stool where one of the legs is so much more important than the others? It just doesn't seem balanced to me. So there are policy implications, even if that were the explanation alone, and it probably is part of the explanation, that we don't value our clinical and educational missions enough in academic medical centers. But it is a different policy implication than you would draw if you actually saw a true apples to apples comparison that showed that the women and the men had different career trajectories. And so when I started doing this research, I thought really hard to myself how I could come up with a population where no one would argue that the men and the women were differently situated. And it was right around the time that Larry Summers made some very infamous 
comments um, while I was still at Harvard um, about the reasons that you might see fewer women um, achieving success. And I thought, well, where can I find a population where Larry Summers himself would not say the women were any less able or motivated to pursue a scholarly career? And that's how I came to spend much of my career studying career development awardees, individuals who had received prestigious grants from the National Institutes of Health to perform research as clinician investigators with awards called K08 and K23 awards, which are awarded in a competitive national selection process, no affirmative action, the women are only a minority of the K awardees, but no one would argue that the women are any less bright or motivated to do research, and they all get resources from our society, from the federal government. They get funding to have a substantial portion of their, uh, their time protected to do research. They're expected to articulate a training plan, and there is an expected outcome of this. They are to eventually become independent investigators. And NIH actually gives out one form of in independent investigator award much more commonly than any other. It's the R01 grant. And while it is not the only form of independent funding, it is often viewed as a hallmark of the transition to independence. And so when one receives an R01 grant, one is often believed then to be an independent investigator, and it is a really key transition point. So we decided to do an actuarial analysis. So I'm an oncologist, right? So everything turns into survival curves for me. It's actually a really good way of looking at this issue because we actually have a really good surrogate endpoint here because if you don't get an R01 grant relatively soon, right, the K awards are typically five years and your institution may bridge you for a couple years after that to have protected time. If you don't get independent funding by that point, you're probably gonna get shifted off into doing other things with your time and you're probably never gonna become an independent investigator. And so not getting an R01 doesn't bode well for your overall survival in academic medicine. So these are good curves that look like there's a treatment effect there. Um, not a treatment effect, actually a Y chromosome there that's causing that separation. I decided not to make the, inter the evidence-based intervention is not administration of a Y chromosome. We'll come to the evidence-based <laughs> interventions in a minute. But um, what we do see here is that gender is independently significant as a predictor of R01 attainment on multivariable analysis. It controls for everything we could in publicly available data. So this is data um, now in the NIH reporter system. Then it was called CRISP. At the time, um, NIH did not um, look themselves at the outcomes of individual awardees. Um, what they looked at was um, the success of an individual application. To try to ascertain bias in their peer review processes, they looked at whether a grant submitted by a woman did as well as a grant submitted by a man. But they never looked at whether an individual in whom we invested all these societal resources actually succeeded. And when we controlled for everything we could in the publicly available data, including the K award type, because women were more likely to have K23 awards, which were for patient-oriented research, and men were more likely to have K08 awards, which were for basic science laboratory-based research. We controlled for the year of the award because women constituted a higher proportion of the awardees in more recent years, and the NIH funding environment had gotten more competitive in more recent years. We controlled for uh, the funding institutes because men and women assort to different funding institutes. Women apply more often to uh, the National Institute of Aging or the National Institute of Mental Health or Child Health, and men are more likely to apply to NHLBI, Heart, Lung, and Blood, or National Cancer Institute, and guess which institutes have more overall funding. We controlled for that. We controlled for institutions. Women were more likely to be represented at institutions that had lower overall extramural funding, and so maybe it had something to do with the environment. Women were less well represented at the University of Michigan's of the, um, of the institution population here. And we controlled for specialty, and yet gender remained independently significant. And not only did it predict for attainment of independent funding, but after we controlled for attainment of independent funding and many other measures of productivity and demographics, and you can see that 20 different things that we controlled for that have been all of the things that people have trotted out over the years as the reasons that you see gender differences in compensation in academic medicine, well, they didn't explain the gender difference in compensation entirely. So it turned out that of the $32,000 a year difference in compensation that we saw between male and female K awardees in this survey study that received an over 70% response rate, so it was a, a, a good, rigorous survey study, um, of that $32,000, 
half was explained by specialty alone. But after we controlled for everything else, $12,000 a year remained unexplained. <laughs> and we used formal wage decomposition, decomposition techniques used by labor economists that showed almost exactly this. I show it this way uh, because this makes more sense to a medical audience, but exactly the same thing. And that has just been replicated in health affairs maybe a month ago with a large data set from New York State with um, individuals who are physicians, um, really nice uh, starting salaries data set. Um, same exact finding, about half the difference is explained by specialty, and the other factors explain very, very little of the difference. So what is driving the differences? Specialty choice is a big thing, right? Women may be encouraged to occupy lower paid specialties, and specialties chosen by women may pay less, partly because they're predominated by women or involve less valued feminine behaviors. What do I mean by this? I mean when we see a promising young radiation oncologist, we are fourth from the bottom for gender diversity of all specialties. We're above neurosurgery, ortho, and urology, and then it's radiation oncology, so we don't do so well. Um, under 30% of our residents are female. When we see a bright young woman come into radiation oncology, we almost immediately identify her as a future pediatric or breast specialist. Um, those happen to be among the lower RVU generating subfields of our discipline. Um, we also tend to um, reward in our compensation systems um, interventions. So I told you that boys are taught to be agentic and go out there and do something. Well, radiation oncology, I'm one of the higher paid specialties because I do go out there and do something, right? I can zap any tumor you show me. You've got a lung tumor, I can zap it. You've got a little dot on your, on your CT scan like Brian Zickman Fisher was telling you about earlier, even if it's not cancer, I can zap it. <laughs> Whether or not I cure that patient's cancer, I am reimbursed very well for the intervention of radiation treatment. Now, many of you in the audience are internists who spend an awful lot of time doing that shared decision making for lung cancer screening but, and, and catching things early, but even more importantly, spending all of that time in that packed bus of a visit that we talked about earlier, um, spending that time convincing patients not to smoke or to cease smoking and to persist in their cessation of smoking. And when you think about all the time in evaluation and management services that takes that isn't reimbursed as well as treating something with cure or without, it does make you curious about how we as a society really value the things that we inculcate in the little boys and don't really value the communal behaviors that we inculcate to this day in our little girls. There are also differences in hours, productivity, and willingness to change institutions. Willingness is in quotation marks because, of course, willingness is within the constraints of a gender-structured society. So in our society, men are permitted to marry women who are younger or who have a lower educational attainment, and there's no social concern about that. That's considered perfectly appropriate. Women are not viewed as appropriate when they marry a man who is younger or has lesser educational attainment. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but we raise our eyebrows a little bit. It's not that common in our society. And so what happens is that in this sample, for example, over 50% of the men, these K awardees, over 50% of them had non-working or part-time working spouses. 90% of the women had full-time employed spouses, right? We have a very different environment. So when it comes time to threaten to leave the institution, to negotiate up your salary by getting a job offer elsewhere, who makes the more credible threat to leave? And who's actually able to pack up and leave more easily? It's usually the person who has a more um, a mobile and flexible spouse. There are also differences in rank and leadership. Um, and we could say, well, that does justify um, a difference in pay, but the challenge is if we say we pay John more than Jane because John is the division chief and Jane is not, well, that is justified if the process for determining division chief didn't depend on the department chair just thinking about the last person that he had a good golf game with and making him the division chief. I'm not saying that happens uh, to quite that extent, but you understand what I'm saying. If the process for determining who a leader is um, is biased, um, then we cannot say, then we've overcontrolled the model if we say that that justifies the difference in compensation. And the thing is, we controlled for all of that. And there was a substantial unexplained difference even after we controlled for all of that. So what else is going on? Well, there are differences in employee behavior as well. Maybe 
Mothers are sacrificing pay for unobserved job characteristics like flexibility, and fathers are trying to earn more to support their families. Um, that would be gender concordant behavior, right? Except this was, a, this was a population of physician researchers, right? A relatively homogeneous job type. These are not the clinical workhorses of a department who are taking lots of on-call duties and overnight shifts and doing lots of clinical care. And in our data set, there was no interaction between gender and parental status. Even the women without children had lower pay than the men. And that recent study that I mentioned to you from Health Affairs was led by an economist who gave a quote about this study when we published it and said, but there just must be something unmeasured um, along these lines. And indeed, in some studies, there are some gendered patterns of behavior like this that are explaining some of the difference. Um, they actually built into their study some measures of a desire for um, family flexibility, um, working hours, um, and actually found that it explains none of the difference in that New York State study. So this is it's clearly not all of the explanation. Another explanation, though, is another employee behavior thing, which is that women don't ask, right? So many of you are familiar with the um, landmark uh, book by uh, Babcock and Lashiver that uh, covers the decades of social scientific uh, studies that have shown that women do not negotiate in the same fashion as men. And indeed, if they do so, they may be penalized for behaving in a, a fashion that is not appropriate, right? So women don't ask and ask for it. Certainly talk about negotiation behaviors that um, may differ between men and women. And this may be particularly acute in academic medicine because we are the one group of professionals that really don't have formal training in negotiation, right? So if you read the foreword to getting to yes, there's something along the lines of, um, uh, you know, this landmark book completely revolutionized the way that professionals think about negotiation. I'm paraphrasing here. It's been a few years since I read it. But I remember being struck by that because it's, first of all, it's a man writing about a book, right? Like, this is the best book ever. Now, in fairness, it's true. It did revolutionize the way that most professionals think about negotiation, right? It used to be thought of as a, a hard positional bargain where there was a fixed pie and it, everything was just allocated and so it's distributional negotiation. It was like buying a used car. It was the classic example of the two sisters with the orange who want to share an orange. So if you're going to share an orange, what's the fair way to share an orange? You both want the orange, there's only one orange. Cut it in half, right? But Principled negotiation involves putting yourself in the other person's shoes, gathering information, trying to look for shared interests and mutual gains. And so the two sisters talk to each other. And they realize that one is baking a pie and needs the rind of the orange, and the other is making orange juice. So they can both have everything they want. And so this is the idea of principled negotiation. This is a concept that we do not teach to medical students. We have done tremendous amounts of research trying to understand why careers deviate between men and women in this career development awardee population. And one of the key findings is a tremendous naivete about negotiation. And perhaps gender differences in negotiation behaviors are even worse in that context. There may also be differences in employers' behavior towards men and women. Uh, there's a phenomenon known as statistical discrimination, whereby employers make inferences based on group characteristics like mean productivity, rather than considering individual characteristics when they're setting salaries. And there is the concept of the family wage, the idea that there's a single male breadwinner at home um, and that he needs to support a whole family. And that does make us more inclined to pay a man where we know that he's got a wife who's not working and he's got kids in college and we know he's going to use the money for good ends. And we see a woman with an employed spouse and we don't think about the fact that she's paying for a nanny and we think about what she might spend it on and we think, well, she's just going to buy some fancy high-heeled shoes. No, I, you know, we're going to give the money to the man. And in the end, we shouldn't be compensating people based on what they're going to use the money for. We're supposed to be compensating people for what they produce at work. So these can um, be ways that even well-meaning employers can actually um, contribute to the difference that we saw. And of course, then we all have unconscious biases, deeply ingrained notions of gender roles. So there was a National Academies report published back in 2006, and a new report has just come out looking at the impressive body of controlled experimental studies and examination of decision-making processes in real life that show that on the average, people are less likely to hire a woman than a man with identical qualifications, less likely to ascribe credit to a woman than a man for identical accomplishments, and when information is scarce, far more often give the benefit of the doubt to a man than a woman. So the classic design of these kinds of studies is a randomized CV study. 
We take the same CV, and um, Stein, Price, and colleagues did this with academic psychologists um, back in the late 90s, sent it out to their colleagues who are psychologists. It's like, you know, we do these like hypothetical things. We're interested in finding out what your institution values in terms of hiring and promotion. So we're sending you this sham CV. Would you please, dear colleague, respond to us? I'm looking at, at Brian and Angie, our, our psychologists in the room. Would you please respond um, and tell us, would this person be hired at your institution? And just give us some objective ratings of what you think of their teaching, their service, and their, um, and their research. Turns out, half the group gets a CV that's titled Karen Miller. Half the group gets a CV that's titled Brian Miller. No one gets both CVs. It's the same CV. Everybody gets one CV. Brian Miller is more likely to be hired than Karen Miller. And both men and women rate Brian Miller as better in his teaching, his service, and his research based on the same CV. And this has been replicated time and time again in the setting of postdoctoral laboratory medicine, uh, managers in medicine. Uh, and, and God help you if your name is Lakeisha or Jamal. It takes you nine extra years if you have a name that suggests African-American race, nine extra years of experience to get a job interview. So we are not fair in assessing merit. And I think there is this challenge of the false dichotomy that exists when people say, well, I don't care about equity, diversity, and inclusion because I just care about merit. And the challenge is that we're not that good at determining merit. And this is the information that really means that we have to be transparent and detailed in what the criteria are for hiring, for promotions, for compensation. Because when we are not, and when we like to say, well, we like the flexibility of being able to recognize excellence, and we don't like being constrained, and I understand that. But when we release the constraints of specificity, these unconscious biases have the opportunity to act. There's a study from Hewlett Packard that showed that men applied for jobs when they met 60% of the articulated criteria. So even when we articulate criteria, there are gender differences in behavior. Men will apply when they meet 60% of the criteria. Women apply only when they meet 100% of the criteria. So can you imagine? And then we often have processes that can say, well, she meets 100% of the criteria, but eh, there's one unwritten criterion that we just didn't put on there. And so even though he only meets 60%, he really meets those ones he meets so well. We're willing to waive the criterion for him. We're not even going to hire her because she doesn't meet something that's not articulated. This is what happens in real world processes in company after company that has studied this. Now, up until now, I've been talking about gender like this binary thing. That's because that's the way the data have been. But we need to actually acknowledge that gender is a continuum and that there is an intersection between gender and the other identities. No one has a single identity, right? So the idea that Kimberly Crenshaw developed of intersectionality, where it's not simply an additive disadvantage of your gender plus the additive disadvantage of your race, but actually the unique experience, for example, of being a black woman. Um, and so we have to be very mindful of these issues. And um, when junior people ask me where I think the field needs to go, this is clearly the direction that the field needs to take. Um, but back to the issues of why we see gender differences, we're not playing on a level playing field. Seemingly gender neutral norms, practices, and policies can have a disparate negative impact upon women. These include policies that govern leave from graduate medical education, right? So we have a, a system where people are in the peak of their childbearing years, right when they're receiving their uh, graduate medical education when we expect them to be omnipresent and immersed in service-based education. This is very challenging, and it is more challenging for the one sex that bears children and lactate. And so to say, well, we have these strict policies, but no one's allowed more than four weeks per year, is a specious argument that we're treating everyone equitably. This also extends to expectations regarding work hours. So medicine is notorious for saying, let's have that meeting at 6 in the morning or 6 in the evening, because that way we can include everyone. Right? It's, it's all about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We want to include everyone. So we're going to have those meetings at those hours, because otherwise we're going to lose people to the ORs, we're going to lose people to the clinics, and we just want to be inclusive. But there's a systematic exclusion that occurs when we have meetings at those times as well, right? It is a gendered expectation of our society that women will be doing more of the domestic labor. 
But does that actually happen in academic medicine? Well, we looked. So in a cohort of Generation X K awardees, um, I, all of my research is, is that I'm presenting today is very meta. This is the R01 that I got on R01 attainment. <laughs> uh, and it's looking at individuals of my generation, um, a generation that I will point out was really raised to believe that there would be an equitable division of domestic labor. Many of us had um, either mothers who worked or had friends whose mothers worked, and we really didn't expect there to be any inequality in the allocation of domestic labor. These are K awardees. They're incredibly committed to their careers. When you look at the way they spend their time, the way that labor economists look at time, right? there's paid labor and there's unpaid labor. Well, no huge surprise here that the women aren't lazier than the men. The total labor is actually not lower for the women than the men. If anything, it's a little bit longer. What you see is that last bar, which is parenting and domestic tasks. It's the unpaid labor that is longer for women than it is for men. And you can see one of the paid labor tasks that is shorter, right? That really stands out as shorter, and that's the research time. And it makes sense, right? What is the most flexible part of a physician researcher's day, it's the research time. And what do they tend to get promoted based on? It's research time, right? And so even after we control for everything that we were able to control for in this analysis, which was way more than in the actuarial analysis I showed you earlier, because this is a survey study. And just to reassure you, it's a survey study with a 74% response rate, so it's a good survey study. Um, we found that even after we adjusted for many factors, including spousal employment status, because you remember I told you spousal employment status is really different amongst K awardees, eight and a half hours more per week were spent by women on domestic activities. Now, how many additional papers could have been written by those women with eight and a half hours per week? And we asked one of my favorite questions ever in this study. We said, what do you do when your childcare plans fall through? So it's a snow day, or your nanny's sick, or your kid's got a fever and can't go to daycare. What do you do? And the options were, I mostly deal with it myself. My spouse or partner mostly deals with it. We have someone else we turn to for it, um, or we split it equally. And 42.6% uh, of the women say they deal with it themselves, only 12.3% of the men. So it's not just mommy's a doctor, so we want the doctor parent, because if they wanted the doctor parent, only 12.3% of the men um, did that. And this has consequences. So in fact, um, we see work-related burnout um, at shocking levels in our profession, right? And this has been called out by the National Academies as a priority. Um, we are losing our workforce to burnout. And almost every burnout study in physicians shows almost the same findings. 40% of the women, 30% of the men are burned out. There's always a gender difference. What this study was able to do, because we had a longitudinal survey design, was it was actually able to look at what was driving the burnout. And two factors fell out. One was the time pressures that I just described, differences in time expectations, and the other was perceptions of work climate. And so this brings us to the issue that has been capturing more and more attention lately, which is the issue of sexual harassment. And scholars of women's studies have uh, documented that we should, is that what we were told 11.15? Oh, I will, speed, I will speed up, but okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, because, <laughs> yeah, it's already too fast, I know. Um, the iceberg of sexual harassment is a metaphor that was proposed by Lilia Cortina, who's here on the, um, uh, on the faculty of women's studies. And she actually points out that the things that we tend to focus on, those egregious coercive advances, um, the things that are happening in, in Hollywood, those kinds of assaults and coercive behaviors are very, very uncommon, but get all the attention. It turns out that what's much more common in the decades of occupational organizational psychology research um, is gender harassment. And these sexist remarks and behaviors actually have been shown in rigorous social scientific studies to lead to just as severe an impact on the outcomes that we care about. Physical well-being, mental well-being, professional well-being. What do I mean by professional well-being? Absenteeism, tardiness, withdrawal from work, attrition. We looked at our K awardee cohort and found that 30% of the women in our cohort had personally experienced sexual harassment, which we defined as 
in your professional career have you encountered unwanted sexual comments, attention, or advances by a superior or colleague? And we defined it that way because we wanted to be able to compare to a 1995 study that had used that definition. And so what this, and, and in 1995, 52% of women in a cross-sectional sample had experienced it. So glass half full, 30% instead of 52%, wasn't really the glass half full that I was looking for at the time. And it was actually quite striking. And of course we know that had we asked this the way that women study scholars would prefer for us to ask it, which is 20 separate behaviors that constitute sexual harassment, we would have a higher rate. And if we had asked about patient behaviors, we would have had a higher rate. And these are not um, issues without consequence. So 60% of those who experienced this perceived a negative effect on confidence in themselves as professionals. And this is problematic because you probably know the book by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman about um, the confidence gap, right? Women are already less confident than men, so let's harass them and make them even more um, uh, challenged. And then nearly half reported that these experiences negatively affected their career advancement. So after this, I got an outpouring of emails. I'm going to read you just part of this. In a residency program where the chair invites the male but not female residents and attendings over every week for poker, these things largely go unnoticed. I've wondered if something was pathologically wrong with me that I invited that kind of behavior. Was it because I wasn't smart enough? Was it because I was soft-spoken? Was it because there was something so wrong with me I couldn't even recognize it? I read your article with a mixture of simultaneous dismay and relief. Relief because if they've gone through similar things, then maybe I'm not defective. And I think this is the power. I mean, there's so much there, right? This, this is why qualitative research, this is why stories matter so much, right? This is the Me Too movement, right? The bravery and the courage of women saying, this happened to me so that others know that it wasn't their fault. I don't think I can ever talk about my experiences, partially because of fear, partially because it seems ungrateful to do so. Um, we have a, a very unusual culture in academic medicine um, that permits behaviors um, that are truly intolerable. And we blur lines and we place a lot of responsibility on our trainees to accept mistreatment of all sorts. In fact, in the National Academies report that came out on um, sexual harassment um, after this study, um, there was actually a great quote uh, from a qualitative analysis that they had done um, where someone said, well, you know, medical training is a series of human rights violations. <laughs> And given that, sexual harassment doesn't even really stand out. Um, and we have to think about that, right? And we have to promote a culture of civility and respect. And so um, I had the privilege about, uh, of writing about these and the, the need for us to stand up for one another as allies. Um, and I, I do hope that, um, you know, I told a story and I, I actually held back um, for some of the reasons that the woman who wrote that email held back and the other women who emailed me, because every time they emailed me, I would re-email them back, especially that one, because I thought she'd written so beautifully. And I said, you know, this would, this would have so much power. There is a piece of my mind section of JAMA, right? Stories are what change minds. Why don't you publish this in a piece of my mind? And she said, you know, it seems kind of safe to email you, which is strange, because I didn't even come up with a fake email address, and you could probably find out who I am, but I don't think you will. <laughs> and I just want to say, there are members of my family who don't know about this. Um, I don't want to become identified by this. I don't want to face retaliation, stigmatization, marginalization. I don't want to do it. But by all means, if you can use my words, de-identify them and share them to help others, please do that. And so that's what I wrote about. And the editor from the New England Journal came back to me and said, this is all great, but where's your story? And I said, no, 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 no. I, I don't have a story, right? I don't, I don't want to be the victim of sexual harassment. I want to be a scholar who studies sexual harassment. And then I thought about the hypocrisy of that, right? And then I said, well, but the thing that happened to me, I was rescued by an ally. And so nothing really egregious and terrible happened to me. I mean, I don't do research in a certain area because of it, but you know, nothing really terrible happened to me. Um, and she convinced me to write about it. And I think that that is the power of the Me Too movement, is saying that I did have a very fortunate outcome in that I was rescued by an ally. Um, but others have not been so fortunate, and it's not anyone's individual fault. So what can we learn about the systems that support um, uh, sexual harassment? Well, organizational psychology has told us that harassment is more common in historically male-dominated fields like medicine, where big power differentials and hierarchies exist, and where women are in the minority. And I don't just mean in numbers. I mean in terms of power and authority. 
but the single biggest predictor in meta-analyses of tens of thousands of employees of the incidence of sexual harassment in an organization is the perception among employees that the institution tolerates the behavior. So how can we address that? Well, the first thing we can do is actually gather evidence, not only because we need data to improve our understanding, particularly regarding women who are in underrepresented um, or vulnerable groups, that intersectional analysis, and we need individual data to inform context-specific interventions, but we also, by gathering data, demonstrate our commitment to eradicating these behaviors. And in fact, I'm gonna show you just a second what Michigan Medicine did with um, the brave leadership of our deans here. Um, we can facilitate reporting, offer choices of complaint handlers at all levels of the organization, so targets have many choices of anonymous versus formal reporting systems, um, and complaint handlers who are diverse in every way you can imagine. We need to clarify our policies, and we need to address harassment by patients and families. Our own clinical um, ethics service, um, Andy Schumann is in the audience here, um, really took the lead in um, helping the institution to revise its patient rights and responsibilities document in a way that helps to outline as a leader for society. Because sometimes people say, these are societal things. Like, what can we do? Patients bring this in. We, we're doctors. We're privileged. We can actually make those, rep, those expectations clear. And maybe we can even lead the way in terms of societal change. So this is a study that we did here at Michigan Medicine with the support of our leaders. This is sexual harassment defined by the SEQ, which is a validated instrument used by women's studies scholars, which goes through 20 different behaviors. And you can see here what a horrifyingly high proportion of women and men in our organization report experiences of sexual harassment within the past year from individuals within the organization and from patients and their families. And as you can see here, the tip of the iceberg is very, very small. There's almost no sexual coercion. This is gender harassment that is occurring and must be targeted. And so in order to target that, we have to think about why the iceberg itself forms. And that is the, the bulk of my talk up until now was about the factors that cause the iceberg to form, the factors that lead to the inequity, because inequity is the problem. And so we have to change the structures that support harassment by employing more women, promoting more women, integrating more women into every level of the organization so we end up with a well-integrated, structurally egalitarian workplace in which women and men equally share in power and authority. How can we do that? One thing is we can support mentoring programs. They are so powerful because they can allow women access to opportunities they might not otherwise have had. Help women to play games they didn't learn in childhood. One of my favorite studies here led by my over 10 years research associate, Rochelle Jones, who's actually done so much of the work that I'm presenting here today, um, is this one, which is titled Batting 300 is Good, and it's about rejection, resilience, and persistence in academic medical careers, right? Um, it's not an accident that that is a sports metaphor, right? And up until recently, men were more likely to have those experiences in sports. So a good mentor, in fact, Peter Eubel, who was my first mentor here, when my first grant on um, a subject very much like this, gender equity and radiation oncology, went to a Young Investigator Award um, career development uh, review panel that had previously only funded awards in biology and physics, and I should have just known not to even try to squeeze the square peg into the round hole there, but I did. And I'm looking at Kelly Parody, who's, who's currently trying to do that with medical physics right now. Um, I didn't get the, uh, the grant, and my scores were all over the place on one metric, which was likelihood of success in radiation oncology. And I thought, like, wow. Like, I don't even know what the, what the scoring system was, because I got some fives and I got some ones, but nobody was in between. And, and it was a little bit um, disappointing, right? And I came to this like most of us in academic medicine. I hadn't had a lot of failures, right? I was first in my class at Harvard, right? right? So like, I, okay, but I don't have a potential for future. According to several people who were on this grant review committee, no potential for success in the field. And Peter Eubel put on my desk a clipping from um, the, I, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, uh, but it was about the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and how they failed a number of times before they started a real circus. And he just said something along the lines of, chin up, it happens, you know, apply again. And it was enough to keep me from quitting. 
And we heard story after story after story um, in, that st in that study, so I encourage you to read that one. Um, mentors can teach negotiation skills, and mentors can advocate and be negotiators on behalf of their protégés. Um, ideally, mentorship is structured as a network rather than hierarchical dyads, not only because it helps to prevent against the risk of abuses of power by a single powerful hierarchical dyadic mentor, um, but because it's more efficient. You know, if you've got a mentor who is well positioned at the national level, um, they are are going to potentially not be sitting in the office next door to you when you have a thorny methodological problem you want to work at. Having mentors who are different and meet different needs is very important. And of course, we have to be mindful of sponsorship because there is an action by which individuals who are in positions of power and authority can identify certain junior protégés to take their place when they can't give a prominent international talk or to be on the editorial board when they don't have the time to do it. And they put a little bit of their reputation on the line. They say, I can't make it, and I know you were looking for another senior person, but really think about this person, because they're even better than I am. And I promise they'll deliver. And when they do that, all of us naturally think of someone who reminds us of ourselves when we were younger. And in a system where the demographics of our current leaders are as they are, we have to be more broad in thinking of who reminds us of us when we were younger. Ultimately, gender equity has to be promoted through recognition and changes at the institutional level, including um, mentorship and sponsorship programs. MD Anderson Cancer Center has been a real leader um, in that, in that um, Liz Travis has written about this. Um, but we all can do better with that. Um, Evidence-based implicit bias training, cultural transformation initiatives. Molly Carnes has written about um, evidence-based implicit bias training that can be used in the environment of academic medicine. And I'll ask our panelists about this when we have our panel discussion to talk more about about, um, that transparent, consistent, criterion-based evaluation, promotion, and compensation processes. I've written about the need for term limits. You can see there that if we don't accelerate our pace of change, our current medical students who are over 50% female will have retired by the time we reach parity amongst our deans. We need to promote work-life integration. Um, we can do that through various creative initiatives like Distinguished Scholar Awards that reward um, individuals who are known to have substantial extra-professional caregiving demands. Chris Krenz and uh, Rochelle Jones and Lauren Siegel have all worked on um, some wonderful programs um, with the Doris Duke Foundation along those lines. Um, uh, On-site child care conference is important. Facilitating use of federal funds to be able to support travel-related dependent care expenses as permitted by NIH, but until um, recently, was not possible through any of the top 50 uh, medical schools is important. Um, time banking initiatives are another um, a very interesting intervention. Policy changes, for example, actually changing the policies of the American Board of Medical Specialties and the ACGME to accommodate um, a, a change is very important. And community building is important. Um, we should leverage the power of social media to actually create communities where once there was isolation. I'm very proud of this one because this was created by a bunch of residents in my field um, who were inspired by the hashtag I look like a surgeon campaign and created uh, hashtag women who curie to sort of address that issue that I alluded to earlier of insufficient representation of women in our field. Ultimately, we inhabit a momentous time in history. We have the opportunity to move from the awareness of hashtag Me Too to the action of Time's Up Healthcare. Um, I am a founding member of Time's Up Healthcare. I'm proud that you know, Michigan Medicine is a signatory of Time's Up Healthcare. Um, Time's Up Healthcare proposes a healthcare quality improvement framework to these challenges. We need to look at our structures and our processes, and we need to measure outcomes to, pr to produce durable change. So in conclusion, women do not currently share equally in power and authority in our field. It's not due to a slow pipeline. Evidence-based interventions are needed to target root causes. We have to tailor interventions for women from underrepresented groups. And we absolutely must share insights with one another about how best to transform culture and climate, which is why after this, we're going to have a wonderful panel discussion where um, we'll be able to cross-fertilize from different specialties and different institutions um, uh, to, to try to advance this conversation further. Thank you for your attention. Jay. 
weeks of Rashma yesterday, Seattle closed their public schools. And um, within two hours of that happening, I got an email from a colleague of mine, I'll let you guess her gender, um, saying that she needed to resign from a national panel that she was on because uh, in the context of social distancing, she needed to take the time off from work um, to take care of the kids. As um, Michigan, uh, while you were talking in our public schools, canceled all after school activities, um, which is gonna be awesome for several people in the room right now, I can see that already. How do we- <laughs> I can see that on my face. How do we think about not ma about it, this very particular moment, not having it uh, be used as an important way to set back women uh, to just carry all the burden of social distancing? I mean, it's a, a very timely question, and I think that um, we are actually hopefully going to learn from this about ways that we can facilitate um, participation in meetings nationally without actually necessarily requiring travel. So one of the biggest challenges that we saw um, in that study that I had up earlier by Mimi, Mimi Noel and, and our group um, looking at conference attendance at ASCO, the big 40,000 person um, uh, medical society, the top challenge for women is arranging for childcare. That is not the top challenge for men. And so um, to the extent that we can make the valuable professional opportunities available um, to people who don't have to travel, maybe this will be an opportunity for us to change some of those systems while the broader transformation of our societal expectations of who takes care of the kids uh, changes as well. The other thing is I think that we have to start at the beginning. So that GME policy about who takes time off in the very beginning is so critical. We need to give parental leave to men and women alike because otherwise we're creating expert parents in the women because there's only one person who gets to stay home and they gain the expertise and then they, by default for the rest of their lives, they end up being the expert parent. In my situation, it was actually very fortunate that I had bad pregnancy complications and so it was the best thing ever. Baby came early, neither one of us knew how to take care of a baby. Neither one of us had taken the parenting class because that was scheduled in the last month of pregnancy, go figure. Um, and they came in and said, would you like to take a pregnancy, like, or sorry, a, a parenting, like how you diaper your child kind of class. And my husband looked at me and I was on bed rest and had just had a C-section and he had seen them you know, run down the hallway with my bed. And he was very concerned and said, I, I, I think she should just stay in bed. I'll, I'll, I'll just take care of that. And to this day, Ann Arbor Public Schools being closed is gonna be more his problem than it is mine. <laughs> Reshma, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. I'm so glad I had the chance to hear it here at the University of Michigan. And <laughs> didn't have to go to some international conference to hear it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and you know, I think most of us women in academic medicine could tell lots of stories analogous to the things that you've shown. I wanted to pick up on this childcare question. Mm -hmm. That's something that often occurs very obviously to people, oh yeah, women are the ones who get pregnant and have babies. That's the problem. And yes, the child care issue is a problem, but speaking from mm -hmm. more recent experiment, mm -hmm. experience, not experiments, um, elder care mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. also an issue and is perhaps even more gendered yes. in our society than child care is at this, this day and age. I wondered if you've learned anything about that from your work or or from others? Absolutely, yes. So um, with that Doris Duke program that I described, it was actually inspired by a program that was developed by Dr. Nancy Tarbell at the Mass General Hospital when I was there as a resident, and I had the privilege of writing about it. And that program initially was to support women who had just had children. And it was only for women, and it was only for childcare. And it was because Mass General had realized it was losing women right after they had children. Um, very successful program, wrote about it. Doris Duke decided, we're going to build on that. But when Doris Duke created its program, which has been rolled out at 10 medical schools across the United States, um, Doris Duke's program is for men and women alike who articulate a significant extra professional caregiving demand. Doesn't have to be care of children. And indeed, a number of the scholars in that program have elder care demands. And we're seeing this, um, the physician moms group, Christina Mangurin at Stanford has written really beautifully about people who have caregiving responsibilities versus caregiving plus. So care for someone who's ill. Because there's one thing which is taking care of a healthy child, and it's another thing to take care of an ill parent. So um, I think this is certainly an area of, of ongoing need. 